Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Marianne Pastana, and we have two very special guests for you today. I don't know about you, but I just love curling up with a book that takes me somewhere else. Our first guest today is Kristen Higgins, who's here to share with us her new novel, Pack Up the Moon. So many of you know Kristen. She is a New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, and Publishers Weekly bestselling author of 18 novels. Her books have received dozens of award and accolades, and she is a five-time nominee for the Kirkus Prize for the Best Work of Fiction. So let's welcome to the show, Kristen Higgins. Thanks, Marianne. So nice to be back. Oh my goodness, what an honor it is to have you back and to talk about your new book. Okay, so I got to say, with this book, I mean, my suggestion to everybody is grab a box of tissues and have them handy before you start reading. (laughs) Yes, definitely. (laughs) I, I like to call it a tragic love story with a happy ending. Well, and you know, I found that so interesting because I'm, I've got to say your, your book had me crying, sometimes laughing. And I really felt that it was both like a heartwarming and heart wrenching story at the same time. What inspired you to write this story? Well, you know, ideas come to authors in many different ways. And for this book, I was um, on Cape Cod in the winter, which uh, is usually a very cold place to be with the wind whipping off the water. And I um, had my dog with me. I was trying to finish a book. Other than my dog, I was all alone. And I was taking him for a walk on the beach. And it was just bitter cold, Marianne. You know, just like I was wearing a parka and two sweaters and the cold just whipped through me. And I was thinking, I have to get back before we're both dead here. And there was no one else around. But as I went back to the car, I saw this man, this young man standing at the edge of the water. He was only wearing, you know, a, a like a windbreaker and he was just staring out at the ocean. And I thought to myself, that looks like the loneliest man in the world. And I wanted to save him. I wanted to write his story and, and figure out why he was so lonely, why he was so unaffected by the weather that day, why he was standing standing alone on a beach in this cold winter day. And, you know, he just seemed so lost. And so I, I went back home and I just wrote down that line, you know, lonely man standing at the edge of the ocean, write his book. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, and it's interesting how stories develop. I mean, and to be so acutely aware of your surroundings and being in that moment to see this person, you know, just, kind of just kind of tuned out to the rest of the world has you really thinking. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, I I I know you've read other of my books, but I like to write about topics that are sometimes hard to address in real life. And this is a story of a beautiful, vibrant, intelligent young woman who's happily married to the love of her life. And then she finds out she has a terminal illness. So we all know somebody who's encountered that in their life. And, um, you know, whether it's your cousin or your daughter or or your, you know, friend down the street, a person who's going to die long before their time. And I guess what I wanted to explore is how can you authentically be joyful in the time that you have left, even knowing that your your life will not be that long, even knowing that you're going to leave your beloved husband and family behind. Um, you know, Lauren's life is kind of just getting started when she finds out she has this diagnosis. And so I, I wanted to kind of take a deep dive into what is it like to live with a terminal illness and how can you help the people you love uh, as your death gets closer and closer. Yeah. The people you leave behind because we'll all come to that threshold at some point. 
And mm-hmm. I found it, I mean, because I, I know most of the time you write romantic comedies and, you know, mm-hmm. they're just amazing books and I love picking them up. I pretty much read them cover to cover every time I do. And then to have this one that really dives into grief, you know, mm-hmm. was a real, um, it, it's interesting. It was just real different. But at the same time, I felt that there was a lot there that as far as messages, it would give people some understanding of, hey, you know, this could be something that could happen. Right. And, you know, I, I do love to write comedy. Um, I love to write romance and love stories. And, um, and, and in the past, you know, five or 10 books that I've written, I have been taking on um, some bigger issues because, you know, you can't write the same book over and over, or, you know, I guess you could and change the names and hair colors, but for me, um, you know, I've been writing for maybe 20 years now, and this is my 21st book. And so I wanted to, um, I just found myself drifting and gravitating towards deeper subjects. And, um, and sometimes the things that, you know, you say like, oh, I, I don't want to think about that, that that's too upsetting. And then when you encounter it in your life, you know, we can be so unprepared for it. Um, or so sometimes so unwilling to admit our mistakes or our, um, you know, how hard we are on ourselves. And in, and in this one, it was, um, how do you make the most of your time? And I love that your slogan is make every movement count because that's so true of the book too. Um, it's not that Lauren is this kind of angel with this, you know, otherworldly knowledge of the soul. She's just a, you know, 25 year old who gets this diagnosis and, and makes a decision about how the rest of her life is going to go and what she'll focus on. And she pretty early on, you know, she goes through all the phases of denial and, and, uh, and anger and all that stuff. But then she, she comes to the decision that what she wants to focus is what she wants to focus on is the rest of her life not how she's going to die. And um, I just thought that if you are in that kind of position and you're able to do that, what a gift for the people around you, um, what a gift to yourself that you're not, you know, um, focused on the negative, but, but really kind of seizing the day. And um, another part of the inspiration for this story, when I decided to write about um, a young person with a terminal disease was um, I saw a show called My Last Days. And um, it's a show about exactly this, about p- young people with terminal illnesses. And and every one of them, I think it was like a four or six episode series. Every person was the kind of person I would want to hang out with and have a glass of wine with, you know, laugh with and talk, talk to. Because you know, we're so much more than our physical conditions sometimes, um, and all times actually. And, um, you know, so I wanted to explore all the nuance that goes into realizing, you know, my time on earth is short and, you know, none of us knows how we're going to die or when, but, um, but what do you do with the time that you're given? And I also felt that this was a book about about this wonderful marriage, this love story between Joshua and Lauren, and what what you deserve in a good relationship. These two are millennials. I wanted to write a millennial love story. And I wanted to depict what I feel a good marriage should be like and how you should put your spouse first and and look after them and take care of them. And I think that Josh and Lauren have this really beautiful marriage. It's not perfect, of course. Um, And how Lauren takes care of Josh is she writes him a letter for every month of the first year that he'll be widowed. That's what she spends her last year thinking about is how to take care of Joshua. And um, she knows him better than anyone. She knows his limitations and flaws and, um, she gives him this, this honeydew list as it were of, of ways to get him out into the world and, and walk him through his grief. Yeah. I found it interesting with Joshua. I mean, he's this highly successful, brilliant person, 
but I really liked how you talked about that. He's also someone who's on the autism spectrum. Yes, because I, um, I, when you're, when you're, writing a book, you try to give your character a very difficult job to do because that's what makes it interesting for readers. Um, If you write about a great person who has a great life and no real challenges to overcome, it's kind of a boring book. It's a great way to live, but you know, it's, it's not exciting for the reader. And so for Joshua, he's pretty much the worst person to become a young widower. He never thought he'd meet somebody. He, um, has sort of a difficult time with social interactions, reading social cues. And he's very happy on his own in his own little cave. He's a biomedical engineer. So he's quietly saving the world in his grubby little apartment. He has a couple of friends, a couple of family members, and that's fine. He's very happy in his life. And then in comes Lauren and she's bubbly and outgoing and fun and he can't believe his luck in in finding her. And in just in their courtship and their marriage, she kind of brings him to life in a way that he's never experienced before. And then after her death, she does the same thing. She she walks him through that year with these tasks, getting him out into the world, getting him to connect to people that he might not have thought of on his own, um, kind of forcing him to participate in different things and coming to the realization that, you know, he's got a lot more people who love him than he realizes. And he has so much to offer to the world. Yeah. I love how you, you just wove that all together. And what was interesting to me also was, I mean, you went into some great detail about Lauren's disease. Mm -hmm. Was there a reason that you picked the one for her as, as the character is developing? Yeah, I um I didn't want her to have <clears throat> excuse me. I didn't want her to have cancer. Um because that is uh, a disease that requires so much intervention and also just from a marketing standpoint there have been so many books where the hero or heroine has had cancer, you know, The Fault in Our Stars or Love Story going way back. Um so I wanted her to have something a little bit different. Um And I was doing some research and I came on this blog um, of of, um, a forum for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a terminal disease in which your lungs fill with scar tissue and fibers until, until you can no longer breathe. And one of the people who wrote for this website was uh, a woman named Charlene Marshall, and she was 30 years old. And she wrote about being a young person with this disease that very few people have heard of. If they have heard of it, it's usually in an older person, but it does affect young people too. And I said, this sounds perfect. And I reached out to her and she was so generous and so gracious and so funny. You know, a lot of Lauren is based on her because, the, you know, when I first emailed her and said, I'm writing this book and, and I, you know, I want you to know up front that character is going to die from IPF. You, you know, if you're willing to talk to me about it, I would be so appreciative. And she said, oh my gosh, I would love to. I have to get back to you in a couple of weeks though, because I'm in Hawaii right now. I'm supposed to go scuba diving in a few minutes, <laughs> you know? So she was really like taking every opportunity to live her life as fully as possible. And she was also, you know, really honest about the day-to-day difficulties of living with this disease. You know, it's, it's a hidden disease. You look fine. You, your hair isn't falling out. You, you might lose a little weight, but you know, not kind of the, and I'm using air quotes here, the typical presentation of someone who's terminally ill. And um, so it brings up a lot of questions that, that people are dying to know and ask you, Oh, why, you know, why do you need help carrying your groceries to your car? Why do you have an oxygen tank? Or um, you know, why can't you come to my kid's birthday party? You know, these kind of things where you have to be just so careful when you have this disease, as we have all learned during the past year and a half with COVID, you know, lung diseases are nothing to mess with. So I, um, I was able to get a lot of the um, personal details from Charlene. And then I love to research as an author. So I spent a lot of time talking to pulmonologists and um, reading articles and talking to the 
Mayo Clinic people who are really tired of me. <laughs> oh, I bet they loved your questions though, you know? <laughs> They're so generous, so generous. Was there anything in your research as you're really kind of diving into this pulmonary disease that really surprised you? Well, one thing that surprised me was um, that you can feel really good while having this disease, you know, so that a lot of times you might think you have asthma or this just irritating allergy cough, um, and it can take a while to diagnose, but you can feel great. You can have really good days after being in the hospital for two weeks intubated. Um, you can bounce back a bit and and feel really normal. And um, and I think that's one of the things that really appealed to me was that Lauren and Josh had a really normal life, except for this one thing, this one huge thing. Um, and uh, so that, that was really interesting. Um, to hear about from Charlene and from others with, with IPF was that, you know, you, you're still first just a regular person with a job, with friends, with yoga classes and nights out with your friends and your parents and that kind of thing. Um, so I think what I, I really loved writing about the most in this book is how grief is the other side of love. It's, it's, another expression of love. And when you grieve someone, that's because you loved them so much and they deserve that kind of mourning and, and grief. But, but also that Lauren was so determined that she would not be Joshua's tragedy, you know, and she says to him in one of her letters, don't let me be your life's tragedy. Let me be one of the best things that ever happened to you. One of them, because she really wants him to have a wonderful life after her because they, you know, she believes in him. She loves him like no one else. And um, so Josh goes through this year with, you know, all sorts of emotions. Some he knows how to express some he's, he's tangled up on. Um, He has all these experiences that she's giving him to do. Some of them seem ridiculous and shallow. Like the first one is go to the grocery store, you know, just get out of the house and, and buy some, some fresh vegetables. And, um, you know, as the book progresses, they get a little more difficult and a a little more complicated. One of them is uh, meet your biological father whom Josh has never met. And um, it's kind of her way of, of unfolding Josh, you know, and, and in the way that she did when she was alive and, and bringing him out um, of his grief You know, it's funny, Marianne, we all experience grief, and I don't want to romanticize anyone's tragedy. Um, Lauren's disease is awful. Her death is awful. But her life was wonderful, and she really wants her legacy to be as well. You know, we all lose somebody. We can't avoid that as humans, and we don't get over it. You know, we, we learn to carry it better. We can become stronger because of it. And we can learn because of it and we can, you know, we can grow because of it and still miss that person for the rest of our lives. And, um, and I think, you know, one of the reasons I, I do like to explore um, grief in some of my books is just that because it's, it's one of the most fundamental human experiences there is. I mean, I was just so impressed with how the story came together and how everything was just pieced together. One of the things I took away from your book is really about being able to connect with people. Is that one of the kind of smaller themes of the book? Oh, absolutely. You know, we live in an increasingly narrow world where we can spend an entire day um, with our phones and our computers connecting with people, but, but not in person, not face to face, not in any way that maybe makes us uncomfortable. You know, we can retreat behind texting and IMing and, you know, Instagramming and tagging someone. And that's kind of replacing the old school connections, which are, you know, in person doing things together, you know, 
uh, making time for each other. And I think we all learned that lesson during COVID of how much we need to connect to people and how, how much we miss it when we, when we can't. Um, and Joshua, you know, as I said, he had this life that was, he was perfectly content with, with his, you know, seven people that he had in his life. And um, what Lauren does, I think, is shows him that there are all these other people, people he hasn't met, but also people he already knows who, who are there for him, not just because, you know, they were related to her or her friend or her coworker, but because they care about him. And um, that's something that was really moving for me to write is when Josh starts to realize, you know, they're not just feeling sorry for me. They really care about me and they're my family too, you know, and I can lean on them and I can ask them for help. And that's, I think that's such an important message today too, that help is out there when you need it. So, you know, it's interesting. I I agree with you because it seems like while we're in this great technical age, we also are more disconnected than ever. And I felt like your book really is helping people to look at life in a new way going, gosh, you know, maybe there are different ways I can start connecting with people that really can impact just not my life, but everyone as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I'm, I've been just bowled over by the response to the book. It's been so gratifying. You know, people have said, uh, this book was so cathartic. I'm a widow, you know, um, it helped me so much. You really nailed it. And I cried and I felt so good. And I laughed at some of the absurd situations and, and, and other comments like this book changed how I look at life. And, and, you know, that's not what I started out to do. You know, you don't say I'm going to write a book that changes how people think about life. I just wanted to tell the story of Josh and Lauren and, um, and it's just so wonderful to to have people say this is a book about how to love, how to grieve, how to connect. And um, and also it's a very, I think it's a very entertaining book. You know, it's it certainly starts off sad, but it um, we know Lauren is going to die from the very get go of the book. And um, and what I really enjoyed in, in terms of the writing of this book was that Joshua's story starts from her funeral and moves forward through the next year and a couple of months. Lauren's story, she's also a narrator in the book, and she tells her story backwards um, so that her book ends, her storyline ends with meeting Joshua and realizing, I think I just met the man I'm going to marry. And so her storyline ends on this really hopeful, excited note and so does Joshua's moving into the future after all these months um, with an epilogue that lets the reader know he's just fine. It's a very interesting way that you have that coming together. Was that one of the more difficult things to do in writing this book? Yeah, it was. You know, I, I write um, in what I think is an unusual way. I write the way you would make a quilt. So I, I write a chapter and then I close that document and I start another one and I write that that one. And I I just kind of write the scenes that speak to me initially. And and I might write 20 different documents, 20 different chapters from all different parts of the book, you know, all like the middle, the ending, the beginning. And then when I have enough of them, I I stitch them together as you would uh, with the squares of a quilt. So that kind of helped in terms of the structure of the novel. Um, And it also let me make sure that I was balancing enough fun, enough humor. Um, I I do love some of the um, more like embarrassing or, or absurd moments in the story. And I, so I could see like, we've just had a really poignant chapter. So now it's time for some fun, you know, um, so now I'll, I'll send Joshua to the mall to have to buy new clothes. Cause that's the thing Lauren told him to do this month. And, and that scene ends up really funny and a little bit deeper than it first appears. He has this meltdown in the banana Republic dressing room and the salesman um, ends up taking him for a drink um, in a gay bar um, and they become friends. And it's just so unexpected for Josh. Um, 
So when I can step back and look at the structure of the book, I can see um, how to balance it, I guess. I was completely amazed by that, I'll tell you, because it would make my head spin trying to (laughs) weave a story like that. My quilt would not look like your quilt. We'll just put it that way. Oh my God. So, you know, as people are reading this book, and, and because I know you you feel this way with, with a lot of your books, you have things that you want people to take away from it. Mm-hmm. What would you like people to take away from this book? Um, I think I want them to, to see how important they are in other people's lives, how much their life means, um, and how much they can give to others and the kind of happiness that comes from connecting and being part of other people's lives. I think that's such an important thing. My goodness. Gosh, Kristen, I mean, we can talk forever. I love your books and I I feel like this is another one that, you know, I, I highly suggest for people to pick up and it's just perfect to read whether it's summer or a rainy day. You know, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So where can our listeners learn more about your work and be part of your community? Uh, my website is uh, kristenhiggins.com and all my social media links are there. Um, I'm pretty chatty with my readers. Uh, I do a newsletter. Um, I interact with them a great deal on, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And, um, and I really love that. I mean, that is such a rewarding part of this job is just being able to talk directly with the people who are, who are reading your books. So if you haven't joined me there, I hope you will. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Marianne. Well, thank you, Kristen. It's always such an honor to spend time with you. So our next special guest today is Sarah Zachrich-Jen, and she's here to share with us her new book, The Other Me. Now, have you ever considered what would happen in life if you made one decision that changed everything? If you ever wonder about second chances and maybe do-overs, this mind-bending book is just for you. Now, Sarah grew up in Michigan and has always had a flair for the morbid and mysterious. The Other Me is her first novel. So let's welcome to the show, Sarah Zachrich-Jen. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, well, you know, what a joy it is to have you here to talk about this book. I hear it's getting some really great reviews. And I am not surprised after reading it. It is such, it it made my mind hurt, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I love hearing that. (laughs) Well, and so why don't you share with us, like what inspired you to write this book? Sure. So without getting too spoilery, um, I I had a pretty specific trope in mind. So Um, I was thinking about the classic, you know, guy meets girl, guy loses girl, guy moves mountains to get girl narrative, but I wanted to come at it from a little bit of a different perspective because it's like so often told from the man's point of view and it's often framed as this completely positive thing, whether or not the woman is actually into him or even if she, whether she even knows that he exists. Um, so I decided to write that story from the woman's point of view, um, using a pretty common sci-fi trope. And I knew from the beginning that it was going to have a fantastical, either a fantastical or a sci-fi element to it. Because I had grown up reading stories where these impossible things happen, and I've always loved them. So I, I wanted to kind of combine that fantastical element with with sort of a domestic suspense story and also sort of a story of a woman coming into her own, figuring out who she is when she's thrown into this very singular situation. Yeah, it it is a quite unique story and wow, I was just real (laughs) impressed with it. And, you know, it has me thinking like as you were putting this book together and writing it, you know, how did even that whole process of, you know, because I know you involve a lot of tech in this, we'll put it that way. <laughs> so how did that even become part of the book? 
Well, I I didn't want it to be like hard science fiction, like where the technology is the focus and it's very um, scientifically based. I wanted it to be more of a character story, but I knew that it did need to be realistic enough to allow people to suspend their disbelief. So, um, so I was kind of looking at, I didn't even know when I started writing, whether it would be, whether the the thing that happens would be explained by some kind of technology, or if it would just be quote, like magic, or just something that happens unexplainably. Um, so I, as I wrote, I came up with several, a few different endings, like it went through a few, a few revisions, it had several endings, several middles, and I eventually landed on this, um, this piece of technology that becomes kind of the focus of what happens and the mechanism for it to happen. And there it goes from there. (laughs) Yeah. So why don't you share with us a little bit about the story? Uh, You know, we don't do spoiler alerts here, but I'd love for you to share with our listeners a little bit about the story. So The Other Me is a speculative thriller. It's about an artist named Kelly who lives in Chicago. And on her 29th birthday, she's at her friend's opening. And then she walks through a door and suddenly she finds herself at her own surprise birthday party in her hometown in Michigan. She's stumbled into an alternate life where instead of leaving her hometown and going to art school, she married a guy from her high school and settled down with him nearby. And pretty early on, she finds that she can remember things from both her life in Chicago and her life in Michigan. So she needs to figure out how this happened and why it happened and if it can be reversed. That would be really interesting to happen, I'll tell you. (laughs) I I would absolutely freak out. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting because you do talk about it being like a story of you know, when people want to do things over, you know, you always hear about the mm-hmm. one that got away or what have you. Yeah. And it's an interesting view in what that could look like. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there are so many different ways of coming at that story, right? Like it can be a romance or it can be horror, you know, depending on your perspective. So, um, so yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with thinking of the different angles and how different people might think of something like that happening to them. Okay. So let's talk about the the main character, Kelly. Okay. So she's an artist. Why did you choose an artist? You know, her her being an artist as, you know, Mm -hmm. her, her passion. Sure. So, um, well, well, at the time, this is kind of, it, it came from kind of a personal place. I, I was in my 30s at the time that I started writing this book. I was kind of going through the transition from being in my 20s to being in my 30s, having a child, having a real job. So I I had been playing music all through my 20s. I used to play in bands and I had stopped doing that. So I was feeling this sort of lack of creativity, lack of spontaneity in my life. So I was kind of grappling with that. And I think that's how Kelly was an artist because she's I wanted, I knew I wanted her to be a creative and to have that taken away. And she's kind of formed her whole identity around being an artist, being a painter. And then when that goes away, how does she construct her new identity? And can she do that? Does she even want to? Those are all really good questions because I know many times people, when they get into art, their folks are like, okay, you'll never make money doing that. And I'm not going to support you. So you better find another goal for your life. You got to have a backup, right? Yes, backup plan. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I understand that you are an artist as well. I mean, you've been uh, uh, in a rock band for quite some time. <laughs> Well, I, I did. I played in rock bands all through my 20s. Um, and I, I don't really do that anymore because my my practices used to start at midnight. So that kind of isn't really doable when you have a kid who wakes up at six in the morning and you have to go to work at eight. So um, but it was it was a lot of fun while, while I was doing it. So when you're doing your research for this book, what was really required? What kind of research did you dive into? So I 
did do quite a bit of research into like the art world because I didn't really know a lot about that. So I, I read some books. I read a lot of articles. I kind of, you know, immersed myself in art reviews and things like that to get the language and the mindset. Um, and also I, of course, had to do some research on the the branch of science that is involved in this trope that I don't want to spoil particularly. Um, but I, I did have to do some research there in, you know, artificial intelligence and physics and certain concepts that are theoretical, but, you know, might, that, that a lot of stories are told about. Um, so, so I did quite a bit of research there just to see what, um, what scientists thought might be possible or might be, or what they thought was impossible. It's almost like you became an expert on many different topics immediately, right? Right. I mean, you kind of have to do a crash course and, um, yeah, like you, you get a few books, you read a lot of articles online, you watch a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of it's really dense, especially for, for someone whose life is words rather than science. So, but it, it was, it was interesting to learn about. And I also did a fair amount of research on startup culture because there's a startup in the book. And I had, I had worked in a startup back in the early two thousands, but it had been a while and things have changed a lot. So are, were there other, um, writers that really influenced your work over time? Cause I understand this is your debut book. It is. Um, so yeah, there, there were a lot of writers that influenced me. Like when I was growing up, probably when I was, you know, a teenager, my two favorite writers were Stephen King and Margaret Atwood. So my formative, um, the, the formation of my writing style kind of comes at the intersection of those two almost. And more recently, um, books like authors like, you know, Anna Lee Newitz, she, she's been doing really great work in sci-fi, like a lot of sci-fi authors um, who also do more character development. Um, and yeah, I'm blanking, of course, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, and that's nice to hear, like what inspires other authors, you know, what's the inspiration? Because I mean, there's so much out there. Yeah. And my oh, goodness, I just, you- sorry, I just thought of one. <laughs> Um, and Octavia Butler is like, just amazing. So I, I've gotten a lot of inspiration from her too. Well, and I understand you have a playlist for this book as well. <laughs> I, I do. Yeah. Um, I, and I don't really listen to music while I write, uh, cause it's, it's too distracting to have the words and the music going on in my head while I'm trying to make up words. But I did, it was kind of half vibes and half um, the character voices in my head. So that's that's how that came about. Well, it's definitely something fun that people can, you know, listen to and have um, as part of the book. Because you don't really see that too much where people have their own playlist for a book. Sure. I mean, I've seen it before. And... I know a lot of people get inspiration from music and I definitely get inspired by music, especially when it comes to like a mood or a setting or just, um, yeah, not so much plot, but more just mood. Um, like I'll I'll hear a song and think like, Oh, I, I wish I could write something that gives me the same feeling as this song does. So I know your book really touches on different themes. Why don't you share with us a couple of those themes? So there's identity, of course. Um, and I, I was really interested in how our circumstances and the people we're around can define us and make us into the people that we are. Because, um, I mean, everyone knows that you become like the people you associate with. So it's important that you pick the right people, right? Um, and what what happens when those circumstances and people change and how you change in response to that. Uh, and an, another theme that I got into, of course, is free will and choice. 
and you spend kind of a lot of time. I, I know a lot of people spend time thinking about their own past. I certainly do. And you, you think about a certain choice that you might have made differently and how your life might look different because of that choice or because of an event maybe that you don't even have any control over because so much in our life we don't have control over. And then that one thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing. And there's also a little bit of, um, not to give too much away, but toxic masculinity is a big thing. <laughs> um, and how, who gets to be the protagonist in a lot of stories, both in real life and in fiction. And also how, how toxic sex masculinity can have a benign appearance. It doesn't have to be a man being, you know, unkind or mean to be misogynist. Yeah, I, I think you really wove that in together so well, <laughs> bringing all those topics, you know, kind of together. Was there a main goal when you wrote this book, you know, The Other Me? Uh, I don't know if there was like a main goal. Um, I guess I had kind of some overarching things that I wanted to say. And I also wanted to tell a really entertaining story. And um, I, I get really into character development. So I wanted to create people that felt real to me. That was a big goal of mine. And it, it seems like from, from what I've heard from early readers, it seems like it's really making people think about, you know, their own lives and things that have happened to them. So that's, that's always really gratifying to hear about. Yeah, it really has you thinking about the decisions we make and how it really affects our lives and what could happen if we made other decisions. Exactly. So are you working on anything next? I know your book just came out, but a lot of times authors are already working on the next one. I almost hate to ask that, you know? So. Um, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm working on book two. <laughs> so it's, it's another, and it's going to, it's supposed to come out next summer right now. And I'm, it's another speculative suspense novel and it's about female friendship. It's about two women who were best friends in college and their friendship was kind of toxic and it ended really badly. And then what happens when their lives intersect again years later? Okay. So that sounds really interesting. I can't wait to hear what that's all about. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> it's always interesting. You know, a lot of times you'll have authors that go, okay, well, I'm, I'm already planning like the next three books, or I'm just working on this one. So mm -hmm. there's definitely, um, I'm sure people can't wait to get their hands on the next book. Um, when do mm -hmm. you expect to have that out? Um, well, right now it's supposed to be coming out next summer. And um, as far as I know, that's on track. And it's interesting because, yeah, The Other Me is a standalone. So the next book is going to be completely different. Um, and I always wonder how um, how people write series for years and years and years. But it's it's probably a little easier to get back into that world than have to create a whole new new one. Yeah, you can dive right in. Did it seem like your characters were really writing themselves or was it something that, you know, that kind of just took place? You had like this outline, which, how did that work for you? Um, so, I mean, my characters, I, I do like have kind of a character Bible where I jot down things about them as they occur to me. But a lot of the time I do do a lot of characterization while I'm drafting. And then I'll kind of go back and look at, you know, motivations and what, um, what beliefs they have that might be wrong and um, things that happened to them in their childhood that form their character and stuff like that. Um, and a lot, a lot of stuff like that is just, it just comes to me like, like a character name, like Kelly's name was Kelly from the beginning. She was never going to be anyone but Kelly. Um, and as far as outlining, I usually do have, well, I always have an outline, but I also never follow it. <laughs> like the book never looks like the outline when it's done. I'll just, I'll kind of write, I'll outline, then I'll write, then I'll like redo the outline, then I'll write some more and things will shift and change during the course of writing and revising. And um, it's, it's not the most efficient process, but it definitely, it works for me. 
Well, it definitely does. I mean, everyone's, you know, you've had such great reviews on this book. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a major outlet that has not reviewed your book. Yet. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yeah. You know, and, and it's just so intriguing. You know, it's interesting. I know you talk about the book really kind of touching on how we can really not ever know another person truly. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think it's hard. Like, I think, you know, reading, <laughs> reading a novel is probably the best way to get inside someone else's head, right? Because you're never going to know exactly what someone else is thinking, even, even people that you're very close to. Like, there's always going to be secrets and things that they're hiding, maybe not even for like a nefarious reason, but just because, you know, maybe they're embarrassed about it or something. So it's, it is really hard to know someone the way that they know themselves. Yeah. And, and, you know, and they're always, especially, you know, you, you look back and go, gosh, you know, there are reasons that people come into my life and reasons some of them leave and maybe that's a benefit. Uh, Yeah, I definitely think that's true. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's like the song, right. To everything, there's a season. (laughs) So, and that, I mean, that's true of people too. And I mean, I personally, I do try to keep in touch with people, but you can't always for various reasons. And, and sometimes, you know, those people just belong to certain phases in your life and they came in and they left and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's how it is. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the, a lot of times people in their interests will change, you know, people will grow in different directions. It doesn't make it good or bad. It just is. Right. Yeah. Like um, Kelly and her friend, Katie, they are, you know, best friends in high school because of proximity and, you know, they play sports together and then they grow up and they completely grow apart. And that's just kind of an example of that. Yeah, just how all that happened. Well, and, you know, my goodness, there's so much here in your book that I wish we could talk about, but I know we can't because we don't do spoilers. You know? <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing my best not to give any of that away. Uh, I can't but, wait to do like book clubs where people have read the book and we can just like dish about spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know you also have, you know, resources for book clubs. Yeah, there's there's a book club kit, um, and I have a link um, that is linked from my Instagram. So, and and the book club kit does have spoilers, just a warning. So, you know, don't read it if you haven't read the book. But that's something that my publisher put together for me, and it's gorgeous. It's beautifully designed, and I love it. Yeah, it came very well together and has everything a book club will need, especially for this type of book because it's extremely intriguing. When it doesn't, while it has some spoilers, it doesn't give it all away. Right, right. My goodness, Sarah. I mean, we can talk forever. I just love your work. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about the work you're doing? Thank you so much. So I am on Twitter and Instagram, as well as Facebook. Um, And I have a website, which is sarahzj.com that's s-a-r-a-h-z-j and that has links to all of my social media and you know buy links and my events and everything yeah where everyone can get in touch with you well sarah thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today yeah thank you for having me it was a pleasure Well, thank you, Sarah. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Other Me. The Other Me and Pack Up the Moon are available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. And of course, support our indie bookstores. If you'd like to learn more about the books in the Moments with Marianne Book Club, please visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count.
In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.